Well, good morning, Salem. It's good to see you all this morning. I hope that you had a great weekend and that you are ready to open up God's Word. But before we do that, I just wanted to say a couple quick things. First of all, thank you so much to Tammy and to our preschool ministry. Aren't you thankful for what they do on a daily basis here at the church? I just want to reiterate that again. And let me tell you, I don't walk those halls as much as Jamie does, but the stuff that they deal with and put up with and, and do on a daily basis, it's not for the faint of heart. I'll tell you that much. Amen. Also this morning, I want to encourage us as a church. We sing these songs. I will build my life upon your love. It is a sure found. We sing these songs, but my question for you this morning is, do you mean it? You see, my hope and prayer for us is that we would be a congregation that sings. I was looking around at 830 this morning and I was looking around a little bit here at 11 and and so many of us look bored. You know, it's true. You know, it's mumbling through the words. And I understand uh, we don't always come in here feeling happy. Or joyful. We don't always come in having had a great week. Some of us come in with baggage, with difficulties, with struggles. Others of us, it has just become routine. It has become something normal. But I hope and pray that as we sing these songs, that we would sing them from our hearts and that they would mean something. We, we sing because there is something about the sung words that has more power than prose on a page. To get down deep into our hearts and to affect the way that we think and feel and live. And so my hope and prayer for us is that we would be a people who sing. And I think sometimes when we don't sing, it's because we've forgotten just how big a sinners we are. Right? We, we, we think, oh, I've, I've got it together. Look at all that I've done. We forget the depths of our sin. But others of us, we might know the depths of our sin, but we've forgotten the greatness of God's grace. And it's only when we understand the depths of our sin and the greatness of His grace that true praise flows out that really transforms us. Not just now, but as we go through the week. Because if we can't come in here and sing these songs with all that we've got, what makes us think that we're going to go out these doors into harder environments and live for Christ? If we can't do it with all that we have in the moments that we gather together here. These are battle songs that we take with us as we go to face what the world throws at us and what we're dealing with, good or bad. So my exhortation, along with Jeff, is that we would be a singing people. And if we're a singing people, God's going to do some amazing things in this space. And so that's my prayer for myself and for y'all. And I'm also really excited. One other thing before I, I actually move on to the real sermon here this morning is starting in November, we're going to take a break from Samuel. We've had three credible months. We're going to come back to it. Don't worry. But we're going to take a break. And I've got a very special series that's going to deal with um, a lot of the struggles and difficulties and darknesses of life from God's Word. I think it's going to be five special weeks that I hope you'll plan to be here for starting the very first Sunday in November. More details coming soon. I just want to throw it out there, get it in your mind to say, November, I'm going to want to be here because I think the Lord is going to want to do something in our midst. And aren't you thankful last week for Pastor Jamie and his message? Amen, aren't we? And it just laid on my heart that what if Salem truly lived up to the name Salem, Shalom, peace and that this is a place where broken people with messy lives can come and find the grace and goodness of God that we've sung about because that's what the people out in our world and community are looking for not a place where everyone has it together but a place where people are broken where people are hurting but they're finding hope and healing and grace and restoration. And I think we saw a hint of that last week, and I hope we're going to see some more of it in the weeks to come. Okay, real sermon. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and find 1 Samuel chapter 10, as I pray to invite the Lord into our time together. 
Father, thank you so much just for your goodness and grace to us. Thank you for the way you speak through messages and through songs. Thank you for the way that you challenge us and restore us and breathe new life into us. I pray that you would open your word this morning. You'd be glorified in it. That we, Lord, might be encouraged through your spirit and through your gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, has anybody here ever done a, a trust fall? You know what that is, right? That's where you stand on the edge of something like this. Don't worry, I'm not going over backwards, I don't think. You clasp your hands together, right, so that you cannot do anything to help yourself. There's a group of people below you with their hands out ready to catch you when you fall. And they count it down, three, two, one, and if you're courageous enough, you let go. And you fall backwards. Just like that. Only you don't catch yourself. You count on them to catch you. It's a terrifying moment. Because in that moment you are truly letting go. There's no leg that you can put out. There's no arm you can reach out. The only thing preventing you from hitting the ground. Are these people who have promised to catch you. It's an exhilarating moment. It's a scary moment. And it builds trust, but it also encourages us to know what it's like to truly let go. We used to do this at camp all the time. Trust falls, right? You get your group together of a bunch of kids you just met. (laughs) I've known you for 17 hours and now you're going to catch me. And what's amazing is that almost all the time they do catch I say almost. I was witnessing a trust fall once and the group leader who was leading the group of kids was the first one to step up. She locked her arms. She went back and they dropped her. But she was okay. She was one tough cookie. And here's the amazing thing. She got right back up. She encouraged them. She coached them and she did it again. that's, That's counselor of the year right there. And the second time, praise the Lord, they caught her. But there's just something about letting go of all control and trusting in another to catch you. Do we trust God enough to let go of all that we cling to, our own abilities, and to fall completely on Him? In Samuel, the part that we looked at two weeks ago, God was providing for Israel a king. Through His providence, we saw through the small things and the small ways, he was leading Saul to the, be the king of Israel. And his providence and plan was putting Saul on the throne. But some people weren't sure. Could this man save Israel from their enemies? And this morning I'm here to tell you that God has provided a king for us. But are we sure that, we, that he can in fact save? Do we trust him enough? To let go of all that we cling to and fall safely into his arms. Let's take a look at this passage and think about this idea. 1 Samuel chapter 10. We're going to begin in verse 17. And for the past chapter and a half, this big story of the nation of Israel has zoomed in to the story of Saul in search of donkeys, running into Samuel, being anointed king, The signs that God provided to confirm him in his kingship. The fact that he prophesied with the prophets. If you remember, it became a proverb. Is Saul also among the prophets? But now we've gone from this very personal scene back to the affairs of the nation. And we're back at Mizpah for a gathering. In verse 17, Now Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah. And he said to the people of Israel, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt. I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But today you have rejected your God who saves you from all your calamities and your distresses. And you have said to him, set a king over us. Now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. Before they select a king, Samuel gives them a reminder from the Lord Remember how faithful and good the Lord has been. Why are you not trusting him now? He is certainly able to catch you. When I was growing up, I flew in airplanes 
all the time. All, my mom got a job working for U.S. Air. Some of you remember U.S. Air, which became U.S. Airways and then became, was absorbed into American Airlines. And so because she worked for the airlines, we got to fly quite often. And as a kid and a teenager, I was never afraid of flying. I thought it was amazing. It was so cool. We'd go through turbulence and the plane would be bucking up and down and people would be digging out those barf bags and I would just be having the time of my life. This is a great ride. That's because I was a teenager and like many of you, I thought I was invincible and I would never die. Anybody ever miss that feeling, that feeling of invincibility, like this is going to last forever and I'm indestructible? It was a good feeling. But there was a point as I got older where that feeling faded and when I got on board an airplane, I realized I was nervous. Why? Because I thought about physics. And physics are super weird. Here's what I mean. When you're on an airplane, you are flying in a 175,000 pound metal tube. How should that even be above the ground? I mean, that's ridiculously heavy. It's a 175,000 pound metal tube. 30,000 feet in the air. Some of you get nervous standing on the edge of your back deck. But you sit in that metal tube 30,000 feet above the ground and just look out the window without even breaking a sweat. Traveling at 500 miles per hour. I mean, when you just put your mind around that, you think, how is this thing even in the air? If the pilot has a bad day, if there's a short circuit in the fuel tank, if there's bad weather, who knows what could happen? And if you ever flown on a plane and you're a little bit nervous, they don't make it easy on you because of all the sounds. I don't know what those sounds, something is clicking, something is banging, something is whirring. And I don't know if it's supposed to make that sound or if that's the sound of the wing coming off. <laughs> but I realized at one point that I was now nervous of flying. Even after I had gone through violent turbulence, I had flown through lightning storms where the whole cabin was being lit up, I had gone through ice and snow, fuel dumps. I remember one time I was flying on a plane, I looked out the window and there was fuel just streaming out of the plane. And I thought, is it supposed to do that? It was. We had a technical malfunction. And so they were dumping fuel to return to the airport. And I've even survived perhaps the most difficult aspect of flying of all, and that is being stuck in a center seat. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. There's no battle like the battle for the armrest. And it occurs to me, as I fly, why should I stop trusting now? After all, I've spent thousands of hours in the air. And because of that, I should be able to, after so many flights, through so many circumstances, be able to sit back and enjoy that bag of pretzels that they hand me. You see, all those times in the air should have taught me that I was in good hands. I was in good hands. And God reminds them as they gather at Mizpah, I broke the chains of the most powerful nation on earth, Egypt, to set you free from slavery. I brought you through the Red Sea, through the wilderness, to the promised land. And oh, if you're asking, what have I done for you lately? Let's just recount what happened during the time of the judges. I defeated Mesopotamia, Moab, Canaan, Philistia, Midian, and Ammon, all through the judges that I raised up. But yet, Israel was stubborn-hearted it was not enough for them. That required too much faith in the Lord, that he would come through. And so what they wanted was something much more tangible. They wanted a practical solution, something that required less faith and more certainty. A king they could look to, an army that they could trust, something other than just hoping and praying that the Lord would come through. I think we feel the same way, don't we? We would like less faith and more certainty. That's why we prefer bank accounts to the Lord. We feel much better when our bank accounts are looking good. Our investments are looking good. Not as good lately if yours are like mine. We like the trust that comes from seeing those numbers on a screen. Or 
having that insurance policy in case something goes wrong, or a clean bill of health from our doctor, job security, clear plans for the future, consistent relationships that we can rely on. We turn to these rather than trusting in God to get us through, no matter His past faithfulness. No matter the fact that time and time again, He has brought us through when we didn't think we would make it, when we didn't think things would come together, when we didn't think it would work out. God was faithful, but we still prefer something more tangible, more practical, more concrete, just like Israel does in this moment. And God decides to provide that. Verse 20, Then Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near, And the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. He brought the tribe of Benjamin near by its clans, and the clan of the Matrites was taken by Lot. And Saul the son of Kish was taken by Lot. But when they sought him, he could not be found. Now, in the previous chapter, we saw God bringing Samuel and Saul together. We saw Saul being anointed as king. We saw signs of confirmation. But all of that was for the benefit of two people, Samuel and Saul. Not for the nation. So this ceremony that takes place is for the benefit of the nation to give legitimacy to the decision that God has reached that has been experienced by Samuel and Saul. They had to show that this was not just Samuel's pick, but the Lord's pick. And to do that, they cast lots. I don't know if any of you had one of these when you were a kid, but how many of you recognize the old magic eight ball here? When you were a child, it was very helpful if you had a decision to make or a question to ask. You could shake the magic eight ball and it would provide an answer for you and you would know what to do. Hopefully you're not still making decisions by magic eight ball, but I'm not here to judge this morning. But it can be useful, you know, if you have questions like, I don't know, will the Carolina Panthers ever win a Super Bowl? (laughs) It is certain. There you go. Now, it doesn't say when. We may not want to be alive to see it. But according to the Magic 8 Ball, it's certain. How about this one? Will Duke be successful under John Shire? Right? For you Duke fans. Let's see. It says, it is certain. There you go. The same answer again. So, all right. Duke fans, something to look forward to. Now, I'm a big fan of chicken, especially fast food chicken. And... I believe that the best fast food chicken restaurant is Bojangles. Can I get an amen? Maybe a few? Okay, I know some Chick-fil-A fans out there, some Zaxby's, maybe PDQ. But let's ask the Magic 8 Ball, is Bojangles the best fast food chicken restaurant? And it says, my reply is no. (laughs) Magic 8 Ball, if you would just try a Cajun filet biscuit, you would see it my way. Okay. Let's have a, how about this one? Would Pastor Mike Cooper be able to defeat a possum in hand-to-hand combat? (laughs) Let's see what it says. Okay, come on, come on. Give me one here. Outlook not so good. (laughs) Those possums are vicious creatures. There's no doubt. All right, and, and, and one more now. I know we have, a, we have a lot of technology people in the congregation, and so let's settle this question once and for all. Is Mac better than PC? Oh, oh, I know, I know, I know. Let's see what the eight ball says. It says, better not tell you now. <laughs> All right, Magic 8 Ball, we'll let that one ride. Better not tell you now. Now, if you had a Magic 8 Ball from God, wouldn't that be awesome? You have a question in life, you just shake it, you get the answer. That's, in a sense, how the lots are functioning in this scene. They're casting lots to figure out which tribe, which clan, which family, which person is to be king. Now, for us, that might seem like random chance. But in Israel, the priests had something called the Urim and the Thummim. Think like some specialized dice or a magic eight ball that they could use when they were seeking the will of God. It wasn't something that they used all all the time. 
It wasn't something that uh, they could choose randomly to consult, but for special occasions, God would speak through something like the casting of the lots. And that's what's happening now. And through this process, God narrows it down and reveals from Israel to Benjamin to the Matrites to Saul that Saul is the man. But they go to look for Saul in verse 21. When they sought him, he could not be found. So they inquired again of the Lord. Is there a man still to come? And the Lord said, Behold, he has hidden himself among the baggage. This is not the greatest start for a new king. We don't know why he's hiding himself among the baggage. This is his big moment. He seems to be ducking it. It's possible that he's afraid of the responsibility. Five minutes ago, he was a donkey farmer. And now he's going to be king. He might be concerned about how people will respond to him. After all, he's the chosen one now. Maybe he was just a good soul and helping out with the baggage and got confused and lost track of time. Maybe this was to give the Lord one more step. After we go lot by lot by lot, God says, go find the man among the baggage. And this is more confirmation about who God has selected. We don't know, but they do find Saul in verse 23. Then they ran and took him from there. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people, from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted, Long live the king. Saul looks the part, and the people buy in and shout, Long live the king. But there are some responsibilities that will be placed on Saul. Verse 25. Then Samuel told the people the rights and duties of the kingship. And he wrote them in a book and laid it up before the Lord. Then Samuel sent all the people away, each one to his own home. Now, can the ruler do whatever he wants? Can the president of the United States do whatever he wants? Well, executive orders aside, in theory, no. Okay? But we believe in our country, and it's been a belief for a long time, that the monarch, the king, the ruler, the president, the governor... They do not have supreme authority, but rather they are under the law. This concept is rooted in the very kingship of the nation of Israel. The king is not a totalitarian dictator. Rather, he exists under law, specifically under God's law. This is spelled out in Deuteronomy. God knew this was coming. In Deuteronomy 17, verses 18 through 20, we read this about the king. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law, approved by the Levitical priests. And it shall be with him, and he shall read in it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel." He is to exist under God's law. He's to obey its statutes so that his heart will not be lifted up among his brothers, but that he will do what God wants him to do. And if you go on to read about the story of Israel's kings through the book of Kings, first and second Kings, you'll find that whether it's the king of Judah or the king of Israel, they are all evaluated, not on the basis of their military accomplishments, not on the basis of the things that they built Not on the basis of the wealth that they accumulated, but on the basis of their adherence to the law of God. Again and again, the author of Kings says, this king either did what was right in the eyes of the Lord or did what was wrong in the eyes of the Lord. And at the end of the day, that was the judgment on their effectiveness as king. Why? Because at the end of the day, a powerful and wealthy nation can be a wicked nightmare. Just remember the Soviet Union, right? A powerful and wealthy nation can be a wicked nightmare. It is a nation that is led by the law of God and by a ruler who adheres to that, that experiences the blessings of God. Now, some people are behind Saul. We continue to read in verse 26. Saul also went to his home at Gibeah, and with him went men of valor whose hearts God had touched. Some leave committed to the Lord's king. They've seen the process. They believe in Samuel. They're behind God's man. And they go to follow him to help him establish this kingdom. But others don't. 
Verse 27. But some worthless fellows said, How can this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no present, but he held his peace. See, others don't believe and they reject him in their hearts. How can this man save us? He's a nobody from Benjamin, the least of the tribes. He's got no platform. He has no followers. He has no military accomplishments. He's not done anything significant. You're anticipating a great king, a savior, a hero, a military general, and you get a donkey farmer. Can you blame these men for questioning Saul's ability to save? A thousand years later, God's people will again find themselves living under oppression, but not the oppression of the Philistines, the oppression of the Romans. And they will find themselves again hoping for a king, a liberator, someone to set them free, to fight their battles for them. But instead of getting a mighty king, a political leader, a general, they get the son of a carpenter, born in a stable from a small out-of-the-way town. John chapter 1, verse 46, can anything good come out of Nazareth? John 6, 42, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Matthew 27, 42, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. When people saw Jesus, they said, how can this man save? This can't be the one. Think John the Baptist in prison under Herod who sends messengers to Jesus and says, are you the one or should we be expecting someone else? He didn't look like the Savior Israel was hoping for. But the funny thing about salvation is that sometimes salvation doesn't look like salvation until it does. And sometimes the king doesn't look like the king until he does. You see, ultimately what Israel needed was not a wealthy tribal warlord, not a powerful political leader, but in this case, a lowly donkey farmer. And what you and I needed was not a mighty king or a powerful general or an influencer with millions of followers. We needed a humble carpenter born in a stable from an out-of-the-way town who could go and do what we could not do. See, you and I always know what God's salvation should look like, don't we? Whatever situation we find ourselves in, we feel like we know. Maybe it's sickness that we are struggling with, poor health. Maybe we are buried under a mountain of debt or struggling to pay bills. Maybe we're having issues with our children. Maybe we're having issues in our marriage. Maybe work is difficult. Maybe we are stressed out. Maybe school is difficult. Maybe it feels like our nation is going downhill quickly. And we know, God, this is salvation. Here's what salvation looks like. And we just know that if God is God and he is who he said he is, he's going to save us in the way that we think he should. He's going to heal that sickness. He's going to pay off that debt. He's going to help my baby sleep through the night. He's going to fix my spouse while our spouse is praying the same thing about us. He's going to give us a new job. He's going to help us pass the class. He's going to elect the candidate that's finally going to make things better. And if you listen to our prayers, and if you tune into our thoughts, we always know how salvation should look. But can I tell you something? Nobody ever thought salvation would look like a man dying a brutal death on a wooden cross. No one ever thought that's how salvation would look. No one ever thought that's how God would come through. So the question for us is the same question for Israel. Can we trust the God who saves even if the way that he saves is not the way that we think he can or should? 
Can we take that trust fall and say, God, I have no idea how you're going to catch me, but I know that you will, and fall back into his arms. Despite the stubbornness of his people, after all of his faithfulness, God still provided for them a king. And he provides one for us too. The question is, how will we respond to that king? And do we believe that he can truly save, even if it's not the way that we would have chosen? On September 26th, 1983, three weeks after the Soviet military had shot down a Korean Airlines flight, a man named Stanislav Petrov was the duty officer at the command center for the OCO nuclear early warning system. When that system reported that a missile, a nuclear missile, had been launched from the United States, followed by up to five more, Petrov had a decision to make. His country was the victim of a first strike nuclear attack. And it was his job to respond. But he took a moment to think. He thought, five missiles, while destructive, is not enough for an all-out strike. The detection system that we're using is too new to be completely trusted. And there was no radar verification. And so he judged the reports in that split moment to be a false alarm. His decision to disobey orders was against Soviet military protocol. He faced possible disciplinary action for his decision not to return fire. But today he is credited with having prevented an erroneous retaliatory nuclear attack on the United States and its NATO allies. That could have resulted in a large-scale nuclear war which would have wiped out half the population of the countries involved. An investigation later confirmed that the Soviet satellite warning system had indeed malfunctioned. And if not, for the split-second decision of Stanislav, most of us would not be here today. If you were taking resumes and making decisions about whose hands to put your life into, who you would trust with saving you and your family, my guess is Stanislav would not have been at the top of your list. You would not have chosen a random Soviet military officer that you would never meet and say, yes, I will trust him to save my life when it is all on the line. You wouldn't have made that decision and you wouldn't have trusted him, but he did. And because he did, we are here and alive today. Salvation doesn't always look like we think it should. It doesn't always come from the places that we believe are the most likely places for it to come from. But we can still trust the God who loves us. Saul wasn't everyone's choice. But through Saul, God would accomplish some great things. Jesus, not anyone's first choice when people first saw him. But through Jesus, God has loved us and saved us despite our stubbornness. He provided salvation in his own way and through his own Savior. Are we willing to let go and trust him today, even if the way he saves isn't the way that we would choose? Let's stand together and go to the Lord in a word of prayer. This morning, if you have never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, today can be that day. We would love to pray with you and help you with that decision. To repent of your sins, to turn from your sins, and put your trust in Jesus. To pass from death to life. You can make that decision today. I'm down front. Pastor Mike is down front. We would love to pray with you about that this morning. Also, maybe you're here this morning and you would say, Pastor Brian... I'm looking for a church to be a part of. We would love for you to join our fellowship and we would love to talk with you about that this morning as well. Maybe you're here. You've never been baptized and taken that first step of obedience and faithfulness to Christ. We would love to help you with that. Maybe you're here and as you look at your own life, you desperately need to trust God. 
you're going through something difficult. You're not sure where salvation is coming from. But this morning, God is reaching out his arms and saying, trust me. And maybe you need to take this time as we respond together to go to him and say, Lord, I trust you. I'm putting my weight on you. I'm falling on you in this moment, however you choose to deliver. As we sing together, we want to give you this time to respond. You can pray at your seats. You can lift up your voice in song. You can come down here to the front, put some action behind your decision this morning, and kneel here and seek the Lord. But I want to invite you now to respond as we sing and worship together.